In this short video, I'd like to share the PlanAssessment.com materials to support schools with planning, sequencing learning and age-related expectations for primary science. In a recent Ofsted research review published in February 2019, it was reported that in the schools that were studied, there was lots and lots of practical activities in primary science that was viewed, which was excellent. But they found that one of the reoccurring problems was that children remembered the experiment that they were doing and the practical and the engagement aspects of the working scientifically. But they struggled to remember the knowledge associated with that or the skill associated with what they'd actually learned from the experience. So to support schools with that and planning science in general and working at age related expectations, the plan assessment team put together some materials to support schools with medium term planning leading into short term planning. These materials can be found on the planassessment.com website. Originally, the materials started out on the ASC website, uh, but they have been recently updated and refined and improved and now are housed on their own website under planassessment.com. It's very easy to find the materials. You can search under teacher, subject leader or under resources. I find it slightly easier to go in under the resources section where everything is listed down the left hand column. So it's quite easy to locate the resource that you would like. So there's several different materials that are on there that are actually free for schools to access. The first one being the examples of work. So what they have done is they have collated for every topic in all year groups from year one through to year six, examples of a child's work for the whole of a unit for every topic in primary science. So this is really, really useful for several reasons. It can help a teacher to see how another teacher has planned a variety of different experiences for the children to immerse them in the concept that they're learning about and to practice specific skills that lend themselves to the, that unit of work too. It also helps the teacher to see how um, another teacher has encouraged the recording of learning and evidence that learning as a result of different experiences. And it's useful to see then how that is sequenced through a topic. So at the beginning of a topic, there might be a lot of immersion activities linked around um, seeing the concept in different ways, um, recording, linking to new knowledge, new vocabulary, new information regarding the concept, experiences linked perhaps to the outdoors, and then how that leads later on in the topic to maybe a longer piece of inquiry, and then to the children being able to imply the, apply the knowledge that they've learned or apply a skill in a different context um, towards the end of a unit. So there's lots and lots of uses of this exemplification, and it's been moderated at age-related expectation. So to encourage our teachers to achieve these expectations in their own classroom, if we look at the examples of work, first of all, when we come to plan a unit, then this can really help us see what opportunities to plan for and what type of recording to encourage with the children. Alongside that resource, there are also the knowledge matrices. So this is usually two pieces, two sides of A4 paper, sometimes it goes on to three, but two sides of A4 paper per topic that we could, teachers can use prior to planning a unit to help them understand progression, to help them see what the important aspects of a unit are to help them to see how to encourage a variety of different working scientifically inquiries and generally how to go around planning for that unit and the important aspects. Often what can happen in primary science is you can provide lots and lots of engaging activities but we forget to think about what that learning is that the children are, that we're trying to achieve by the end of a unit of work. So what this, um, these knowledge matrices do is really help the teachers to focus in on the important parts and to think not only about the type of practicals or the type of immersion in inquiry that we can provide for the children, but also how that links to the specifics in terms of a skill or a piece of knowledge that the children need to be able to learn and genuinely understand. 
So let's have a little look at the knowledge matrices for one specific unit so we can look at the structure. So generally speaking, they look a bit like this. I've taken some of the content out just to make it easier to fit on the screen. But generally speaking, there are two sided format that look a bit like this. There's one for every year group and for every topic. So they can really help you to organize your approach to a unit. So let's take year three plants. So right at the very top of the knowledge matrix, you get the national curriculum expectations, the statutory requirements that we need to teach in this age phase. Now, this is quite generalized. It doesn't give us an awful lot of detail because it's up to the teacher to then provide and plan for work that then fits and matches the needs of their children. But this can be quite difficult because if we don't have the ideas and we don't know where to start, then sometimes this feels like it's too brief. So the plan assessment unpicks that national curriculum statutory requirement with the examples of work and then with the rest of the information in the knowledge matrices. So below the requirements, we have the prior and the future learning. And this is really good for several reasons. Well, firstly, we can use the prior learning to see when the children last came to this concept. So this is a year three topic and they last came to this unit of work or this area of learning to do with plants in year two. So when we're looking back, we can see if it was a unit they did two years ago or if it was a unit that they did last year. And it allows us to use that prior learning as an AFL at the beginning of a unit to see if the children have can retrieve any information from that unit, if they have retained any of that knowledge and if they can use any of the vocab from that unit of work. So it's great for AFL. It's also good for COVID catch up because um, if those children have missed that unit uh, or had limited opportunities because of school closures, then we can be aware that that might be a, a larger gap in learning than we might ordinarily have. So again, it helps us to just fine tune where those gaps and misconceptions or lack of retrieval of knowledge or vocabulary might be. So we can use that for assessment at the start of a unit of work. We're also then got to the future learning, and this tells us where they come back to this unit again. So in terms of progression, we know that our topic fits in in between these two boxes here. So this became before our topic fits in here and they're going to come back to it in here. It says year five and then again in key stage three. Another reason this is quite useful, because this research study from Ofsted, also found out that a very positive from schools was that lots of schools have detailed progression documents that were well sequenced, that were housed on their school website for everyone to see, they were all positives. But what, they, what was missing from that then is that these progression documents that were detailed and put together really effectively wasn't then being used in the classroom by the class teachers on a day-to-day -day basis. So it was how can we take that information that might be housed on the school network or on the school website and make that in a usable format to use day-to-day. -day. So this has broken that progression of knowledge down into what's appropriate for the topic that the teacher is teaching at that current half term. So really, really useful to get that as a working document as well as being housed on your school website. So I like to think of this as the progression or sequence of knowledge across the school, where your topic fits within that whole school curriculum map. Below that on the knowledge matrix, you then get the link to the understanding of a concept and the vocabulary link to the topic. So we've got the key learning and key vocabulary. So this takes the national curriculum statements and it just adds a little bit more information. So the teacher knows where to take it and at what kind of detail the children need to be confident with understanding and being able to talk about. 
So I like to think of this, it's not in child speak, but I like to think about this is if I came to chat to your children at the end of this topic, or you were to chat to your children at the end of the topic, or the subject leader was doing a pupil voice scrutiny, would your children be able to talk about the concept of plants in a kind of year three way? So let's take that topic and um, that word, that vocabulary word there, photosynthesis. And then if I look back to the key learning here, it talks about photosynthesis as the leaves use sunlight and water to produce the plant's food. So that's kind of given us really clear indication of how far to take that understanding. So if the children can chat to me about what photosynthesis is and have that understanding that it happens in the leaves and they use the, they, the water that's come is transported from the roots through the stem into the leaves and the sunlight to produce its own food. It knows it doesn't eat food like an animal would eat food. Then that's a really positive that's telling me that they've understood that topic at a year three level. So this is really good at seeing how to how far to take, how much detail we need, but also it helps to reassure us that sometimes we can go a bit off track and we try and go too much information and then we're not sure what are the important things that we want the children to be able to recall and to be able to talk about. So that's really useful for that purpose. You've also then got possible evidence. So again, this helps us to really narrow down. There are three key bits of information that I'd really like the children to be able to take away from this unit. So out of everything, it, I don't want to get confused of do they know that, do they know how, have they done this, have they done that? All of these different opportunities, what's the most important? I'm going to look at those three things. And if I want to have that evidence, yes, I want the children to be able to talk about it in their own words, alongside the scientific vocabulary with some confidence. But I'd like to see some of that evidence in the books as well. And I'd like to see some of that evidence with some level of independence. So if I opened up one book, child's book, who is on track, and I opened up another child's book, who I thought was on track, track the words and how they've recorded that in the book are a little bit different. So if they've written a sentence or a short paragraph, or they've written a letter to uh, a character from a story that you've been working on in relation to the science, that there's some of their own words within there alongside the scientific vocab. It's not just a worksheet with exactly the same text on both or a copied diagram with exactly the same copied labels as every child has in their books. It's some kind of independence on there. And if teachers aren't quite sure what that looks like, then they can go back to the exemplification and see how it's represented in the, those examples of children's work in those um, exemplar materials. And those exemplar materials have all a child's work for the entire topic. So it's got everything that the children have experienced, talked about, the learning opportunities that have been presented, and then that's how, how, it, how they've recorded. And the recording is very much about what the children have learned, not what the children have done. So a really nice example of that might be the children in year one are learning about the structure of different animals, um, the learning about mammals, birds and fish and how they're different. You might go on to do amphibians and reptiles as well. And they've done a sorting activity. You've provided them with lots of pictures of different animals and they've started to sort them. You've talked prior to that how you would sort them and what kind of features a mammal has compared to a fish, compared to a bird. They've had a go at the sorting activity. I might take a photograph of that and pop it in the children's books if they've done it in uh, sorting hoops and things like that. But actually the evidence that they've learned something at the end of that lesson is, could that child tell me something about birds, some features about birds? So do they know it's got a beak, they have feathers, they have two legs, and they have wings and they might even be able to tell you about some exceptions like penguins and how penguins have got wings but they don't use them for flying like other birds they might they use them to help them to swim so they might talk about a bird in that way picking out its features beak feathers two legs wings most can fly 
that's what I want at the end of that lesson, not the fact that they can cut and stick and put pictures in the right places. That's the doing. They need to go through that process to be able to help them. But the learning at the end of that is can they talk about those features? And that just really helps us that possible evidence to pull out the important parts of the topic. And it links back to that exemplar material. OK, what's next? Well, then we've got the misconceptions. So they've just picked out some common misconceptions that a lot of children at this age may have in relation to this unit of work. Again, it has several uses this. Firstly, if we know what those misconceptions are as a teacher, we can start to keep our eye out for them in our lessons and when the children are talking to see if any of our children have these common misconceptions as well. Also, we know what they are at the beginning of a topic. We can start to plan in some opportunities to unpick some of these because it's probable that most or some of our children would have some of these misconceptions because they're common ones. Another thing about these that can be quite useful is we can look at them as teachers. And if we're looking at a topic and those misconceptions are confusing us a little bit and we're getting a bit concerned about do we understand that unit as much as we should, then it can flag something up for the teacher and we can send them off to do some quick CPD on some background knowledge. Now, teachers don't have a lot of time. So um, I'm going to direct you in terms of misconceptions and subject knowledge for teachers to this website. It's called Reach Out CPD. It's just for primary science and it's completely free. Every topic's covered in primary science. And if a teacher looks at those misconceptions and feels they need a little bit of help, they can go on to one of the modules here, like light in lower juniors, and they can do a 15, 20 minute module. Each module comes in four parts. So it's a couple of slides in each part. It's generally some background information, something perhaps about vocabulary or a particular skill that is important in this unit of work. And generally um, a resource or practical or idea that they can put into their teaching. Each module should take no more than five minutes, each part of the module. So for a whole module on light, you've got four little parts to it, five minutes each, at the most, a 15, 20 minute module. So this can really help to identify any issues that teachers might have with that. So this is separate to the plan assessment, but a really nice website to have as well to support your teachers with. And what's what I find is really nice, it's really quick and easy to do. Um, if I started searching, maybe it's evolution inheritance I was struggling with. And if I start searching on the internet for ideas on that, it can go way beyond what we need to understand as a teacher in order to help children in our class. And this just keeps it really, really focused, which is really good, particularly as we don't have a lot of time to do all of that background reading separately from our teaching. Really quick, easy resource. So when you're thinking about that key knowledge and that key vocabulary and that key learning, you're looking at what the possible evidence say uh, and what the important parts of that unit are. And then you're using that to help you make a judgment alongside that exemplar material as to whether the children are on track. And I would say, if I've got this slide up when I'm delivering this in schools is put a big circle around this. Ultimately, that's what we're looking for, isn't it? Can the children explain the concept in their own words, alongside the scientific vocabulary, with some level of confidence and accuracy? And we'd like to see that in the writing as well, particularly as you get older in school. But actually, can they do that verbally? So we want lots of opportunities to model that with the children, to get them to practice it verbally to get them to use new vocabulary, to put it into sentences, to maybe as they get older, put it into paragraphs, to apply that to a different context. That's what we ultimately want them to be able to do. So below the key learning and the understanding part of the knowledge matrices, we then have some support regarding inquiry. And I like to think of this as, um, a list of different ways of immersing children in a concept. So this topic's about plants. 
So these are all the ways I can practically immerse the children in plants at year threeness, at the level that's going to be appropriate for that year three topic. I always like to say this is like your sequence of learning. If, if, if we were looking at this and um, we were looking at how to approach this in a practical manner, these are all the opportunities I would expect us to be planning for. Some teachers say to me, how many of these should I plan? I say all of them. However, there's that realization that when we're teaching, sometimes we have something gets in the way in an afternoon lesson. So maybe you've got a visit in theater and it takes some of your science time away. So we've got to use this to plan in these opportunities to make that learning appropriate for that unit. So we're trying to get them all in, okay? Or as many of those as we can. But if we are missing any app, there's gotta be a real reason why we think that isn't appropriate. So we wanna plan as many of these in as we can all of them preferably and there's got all different types of inquiry here so we've got observe over time we've got investigate and test we've got research using secondary sources we've got classifying and sorting and grouping and often towards the end we might see an opportunity for applying the learning as well so after they've learned about um, the conditions for growth about pollination and seed dispersal we might want to think about uh, imagine they're uh, explorers in the amazon rainforest and they've discovered this new species of flowering plant and they're going to design what this new species looks like and talks about the different parts of their plant and its functions and what it needs to grow and then how it's pollinated and what it sees the light and how they're dispersed. And they're gonna apply all that learning to that scenario. Some really nice little ideas for um, assessment towards the end of the topic. So these are all ways of immersing children practically in that concept. And we're gonna try to plan for all of these in our topic. And then we've got this possible evidence again. So I like to think of this as, as a result of all of that immersion, what can the children now do better or know more or understand more? So what, as a result of doing that, do children know more, understand more or can do more? So sometimes this immersion will be about a particular skill. So it might be being able to draw and label a diagram with some accuracy, or it might be about drawing conclusions or the planning part of an investigation. Well, sometimes it will be linked back to the knowledge as well, because sometimes that inquiry is giving us an opportunity for the children to see that concept in a different way, maybe to practice the language verbally whilst doing that inquiry, uh, or for us to model that language during that inquiry. So it might be linked to the knowledge. So it could be knowledge or it could be skill. So it's no one understand more, or can do more as a result of that inquiry. So this is about sequencing the day-to-day -day practical immersion activities. And this is what it would look like as a result of doing those practical opportunities. So again, this really helps us. And again, we can see that in the exemplar material, how another teacher has approached that. They've also just released some materials for EYFS as well. So they're very, very similar to the knowledge matrices, but they've called them the EYFS matrices this time because it's not a specific type of knowledge that they have to have a specific curriculum. We're following more of the direction of inquiry from the children. So these are new, these are in line with the new EYFS framework. They follow a very similar um, structure. So by having these knowledge matrices across your school from EYFS through to year six, you will then have that consistent approach where there's still some flexibility for teachers to teach in their own way, but there's a lot of support. And those the, the, the format of those knowledge matrices allows that consistent approach through school. The EYFS ones are very, very similar, but they have some additional materials in there as well. So they have some information about the role of the adult. When it looks at what the children can do 
a lot of it might be also to do with fine motor skills it's to do with the a lot of it around talk and what they can talk and also what they can draw so there's a lot to do with drawing in there as well um, and it's also in this one, we've got some links to useful text and how you can link it into real jobs. Say you're doing something on seasons, it's got something out you could look at being a weather reporter. Uh, so there's some other information in the UIFS on top of the type of um, information that I've just shared with you from the year one to year six curriculum. So your EYFS staff will really value these as they're writing their new curricula in line with the new framework. So you can also use the knowledge matrices to help with monitoring. So you could um, be using the possible evidence for the knowledge and the understanding side of a unit of work. And you could get teachers to sit down at the end of a half term and share a child's book or two children's book from that unit of work who they think are working at Secure and they could use the possible evidence from the knowledge matrix, see what the important parts of that unit are and see if we can see the evidence in the children's book. If you've got two books there, then that's really good because you can see there was some level of independence when the children were recording that. Could they record it in their own words alongside that scientific vocabulary? So we can do that through shared moderation and through shared professional dialogue supporting one another. Or you might use the knowledge matrix as part of lesson observations and you might be looking what what's going on in lessons and we should hope to see the lists of different types of inquiry immersion practical opportunities we should see one of those happening when we're looking at different lessons is that an example of something that is in there rather than going off track or going beyond what the curriculum needs to do or doing something that isn't in the curriculum we're going to try and keep to what's there and do that really really effectively and have lots of opportunities around what is important in that unit so you could use that as part of a lesson observation so if you're a year one subject leader working in year one as your class and somebody wants you to support year six that can be quite daunting as the new subject leader so you can use that knowledge matrix to sit down and then scaffold that learning with the year six teacher and support them with what's uh, what the suggested inquiry is uh, you're directing to reach out CPD for that unit and help them support them with that unit. You could also have a sharing good practice meeting with staff and you could say, bring your books from your last complete topic that you did. Uh, share it with somebody in a similar year group. So one and two share together, three and four share together, five and six share together. And thinking about the inquiry and the possible evidence linked to the inquiry, share the books on the topic can we see that evidence in the books is it similar to the exemplification were our children doing more than an exemplification or was there something they struggled with and often these professional dialogue opportunities will help teachers become more confident with age-related expectation we'll start talking about progression more between our age phases and it'll also help teachers to start raising questions so when you've done it several times you might start to raise issues like maybe graphing is something that people feel we're not getting the graphs um, at the right level as we might want to for that age phase. Or we might be struggling with suggestions of how to do that graphing or recording or charts and tables with the age phase of teachers. And you might then look at getting some CPD to support your staff with a particular scale. So we can raise questions as well. So really, really useful to help you moderate doing work scrutinies, shared professional dialogue um, around children's work, expectations and standards in books. So I hope that's a really useful summary of the plan assessment materials. If you haven't had a look at them or you've not used them in school or you've not seen the updated version since they've been moved to planassessment.com, it's really worth downloading them for free have a go with them in your own classroom first. And if you think they're going to be useful, then introduce them to the other staff for them to have a look at and have a go with. I hope that's been useful. And thanks very much for your time.